Hi, everyone. I'll, let's go ahead and start as people start virtually filing in. Um, so our speaker today is Slava Tersha. Slava is a scientist at NASA JPL, and he'll be talking about uh, direct pick multi-pixel imaging and spectroscopy of exoplanets uh, with a solar gravitational lens mission concept, which is a NIAC funded uh, mission concept. So Slava, I'll, I'll stop now and let you uh, take it away. Excellent. Thank you very much, Prabal, for the invitation. Uh, first of all, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Of course, it would be nice to uh, give this talk face to face because I would be able to show a lot of videos and simulations. But here, uh, here we go. So this is the reality we have to deal with. And so today I will be talking about our NIAC phase three uh, project uh, on direct multi-pixel imaging of exoplanets with a slower gravitational lens. And look, the reality is that until recently, uh, we were hesitant to go public about this project. Why? Because as Carl Sagan used to say, every extraordinary claim requires an extraordinary evidence. Back then, about four years ago, we had a claim saying that SGL essentially a unique technique that will provide us uh, with uh, high light amplification and amazing resolution for imaging of faint uh, distant objects. And uh, so that was a claim. And so that claim was based on multiple uh, 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 papers uh, that were done since 1976. And so those papers and those claims were not satisfactory at the moment. So we had to redo the whole analysis. And uh, by today, we have composed a, a, a series of uh, papers that describe in solar gravitational lens within wave optical treatment. So now what I will be talking about is the um, this, uh, the state where the project is at the moment. So we are going through uh, the, we just completed year one of uh, phase three of NIAC. And thank you for the uh, NIAC's funding. Uh, this project actually get off, uh, got off the ground. And now we can talk about not only the physics of the SGL and potential for imaging of faint sources uh, such as exoplanets, uh, but we also can talk about the mission, the mission design. So today, the discussion here is, uh, I have just one objective here. First of all, to introduce you to the concept and uh, answer your questions and invite for collaboration. Because realistically, we need to open up now because the technique is amazing, it's challenging. I'm not saying uh, we are all uh, out of the boots yet. So, but realistically, there are some challenges, but the feasibility, we, so far we, have, we, we haven't found any major showstopper. There are some challenges, as I, as I say. But reality, we can talk about uh, resolved, uh, spatially resolved spectroscopy of uh, exoplanet. And this is something for you to keep in mind. And uh, so with this, uh, let me begin. Um, so this is a group of people who are uh, actively pushing uh, within the project. And essentially, there are a group of collaborators. It's much larger. It includes not only Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Aerospace Corporation, uh, UCLA, they're uh, a, a private uh, uh, company involved, it's Explore. This company Explore is in Seattle. It's a small uh, small business in space area. So they're our private uh, uh, industry partner to develop technologies and take them to the market, essentially demonstrate the capabilities that we have, technological capabilities that are needed for the solar gravity lens. And so there are many other collaborators uh, that are uh, working with us. But I think what we uh, really would like to have is uh, to have people who are capable of uh, studying the signatures of exolife uh, from a resolved imaging of exoplanet. This is something um, we only dreamed about, looking at W first and uh, then studying Lewer and uh, HubX. Here we're talking about very different uh, uh, situation. So with this, let me begin. Of course, our, our first challenge is uh, the, the, uh, the fact that um, uh, our, 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 the main challenge is that the exoplanets are very far. Here you see the picture that was taken by Cassini spacecraft, and this is Earth, this is us. And for this group, I don't need to go through in detail uh, uh, the reasoning why the challenges are there. So the, the fact that the uh, exoplanets are so far, we need a very significant light amplification. There is another picture of us, uh, you and I and everybody on this planet, but now it is taken by Curiosity uh, uh, rover on Mars in uh, January 31st, 2014. This is Earth. And so it's taken by the must come on the rover. 
And uh, if you zoom in, you see, uh, you get some resolution. You see Earth and the moon. And essentially, again, this is us. And this is saying that we need uh, not only light amplification, but also resolution. And for that, uh, of course, this, this is a very well-known picture where we have uh, the sun and the Earth is down there, very little rock that is compared to its uh, host star is very small. So realistically, resolution is very helpful. So the challenges are quite, uh, quite significant. So how can we deal with those challenges when we talk about imaging of exoplanets? So here, direct imaging, we have a wonderful pictures taken uh, by multiple instruments. And here we see uh, the planets were discovered orbiting uh, by using direct imaging technique. This is the super Jupiters orbiting nearby stars anywhere between uh, in the 90 to 25 light years away to 310 light years away. And here we're talking about a uh, very big gas giants orbiting their host stars at a very large distance, maybe a hundred astronomical units away from, from the host star. So this is what we can do with uh, direct imaging technique. But uh, as you see, uh, to, to discover, even to discover exo-Earth with this technique will be very challenging because we need to have light amplification and resolution. So this is why, for example, if I want to image uh, our uh, planet, uh, if I take Earth and put it at 100 light years away, to image this object with just one pixel, I need to have access to a telescope with a diameter of 90 kilometers. So that's the challenge, right? So it's basically the 13,000 kilometers uh, seen from the distance of 100 light years away. And here, for those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles area, Jet Propulsion Lab is conveniently in the middle of this picture and by Dana Point is 90 kilometers away. And it's only, it's only what, 10 kilometers uh, shy of, uh, uh, <laughs> of the Kármán line, so the, the, the distance to space. So, so this is the challenges we have to deal with. So resolution, and amplification requires a very significant uh, 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 apertures. So um, it's, it's just for one pixel. If you talk about multi-pixel imaging, such as uh, this picture, it's blue marble taken in 2002. So this picture is 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. Can we ever have pictures like that over distant worlds? So reality is that uh, not with current techniques, not with current astronomical capabilities, and besides visiting those objects and maybe in 300 years from today, uh, can we do something uh, by remote investigation? So uh, looking at those object, objects remotely. And this is, uh, this is why uh, we have to look at the capabilities that we have today on the ground. So today uh, we have uh, a European extremely large telescope that is being built in Chile and it is 39 meters and it will uh, come to operation uh, in a year from today. So realistically, this is 39 meters on the ground. And so on the right, you see all the telescopes that were built uh, to date, uh, going all the way from, uh, from a meter class to this 39 meters uh, European Extremely Large Telescope. And of course, the 30 meter telescope that will be built in Hawaii, it's, it's only 30 meter uh, instrument. Uh, so this is on the ground. Going to space, we're talking about Kepler, 1.4 meters. And James Webb, when it flies, it's 6.5 meters. So uh, nowhere close are we, uh, are we getting to this uh, required 90 kilometers. So this is the reason why we start looking at something a very unique that nature gave us. It's a solar gravitational lensing. It's not because we want to uh, be engaged in the science fiction, but it's basically out of realization that nothing else can help us to observe exoplanets uh, directly. So, but looking at the solar gravitational lens, see, in this picture on the right, on the left, you see our sun and it, it conveniently uh, the nearby star Alpha Centauri system is on the right. It's a logarithmic scale. And of course, solar gravitational lens in, uh, is a focal region begins at roughly 550 astronomical units away. And it's placed in the middle of this picture. So the scale is logarithmic. According to general theory of relativity, any light ray that is passing by a massive body, the trajectory of that, of that light ray is uh, now curved. So the light ray has been bent and the uh, gravity plays a role as, uh, as a refractive medium here. So essentially gravity acts as a lens and uh, the light rays that are enveloping the sun from two different sides, if, if you see on this picture on the, on the bottom, 
So the light rays that are touching the sun from the two different um, uh, points essentially will be focused at the very large distance, which is roughly 547 astronomical units away. And so because uh, the gravitational bending is uh, inversely proportional to impact parameter, so uh, the light rays that are further away from the sun will be focusing further away from the sun. So realistically, there is no single point, it's a focal line that begins at 547 astronomical units and continues pretty much to, uh, to infinity. And so, uh, uh, but realistically in the practical sense, if we can place a one meter telescope in something that we call strong interference region in the solar gravitational lens. And the strong interference region is uh, shown in this picture. It's a pencil sharp beam that is uh, very close to the optical axis of the solar gravitational lens. And for your benefit, we define optical axis is the line connecting the center of the object that we image the, and the center of the sun. If you continue with that line, so this is your optical axis and the focal region of the SGL where the light that is just touching the, uh, the surface of the sun will be intersecting the two light rays. So this is 547 astronomical units away. And of course, a being with that a pencil sharp beam, you can benefit from very high light amplification. And if you are able to carry a coronagraph to block the sun, so blocking the sun will allow you to see something that is uh, unique to gravitational lensing, the, uh, the phenomena called Einstein ring. So on the right picture here, we use a solar coronagraph and uh, the Einstein ring that corresponds to the image of the exoplanet is now formed around the sun. And so the telescope that is being placed in the focal region of the solar gravitational lens, when it looks back to the sun, it sees the Einstein ring. And um, let me give you an analogy. Imagine yourself sitting in a movie theater. So sitting in a the movie theater, you see a project, you have a projection, a projector that is behind you and you have a screen just in front of you. And so your eyes are seeing the image from the entire screen because uh, the uh, image, the light field is being reflected from that uh, screen and uh, your eye seeing the whole image. Now uh, that projector, replace that projector with the solar gravitational lens. So the SGL does the same projection into the focal region of the solar gravitational lens beyond 547 astronomical units away. So the light field is there. And for example, if I take that object, uh, like our Earth-like planet, I put it in 100 light years away. So the diameter of the Earth is 13,000 kilometers. So the SGL forms an image of that object within diameter of 1.3 kilometers in the focal region of the SGL. And so uh, that image, 1.3 kilometers, there is a light field that is being uh, projected by the SGL in that region. But un 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 unless I put a, a telescope that will be able to see, to sample that light field, I see nothing. So realistically, I need to put a telescope in that region the telescope should look back at the sun at any given pixel in a sense. Look, I have a 1.3 kilometers image and my telescope will be one meter. With one meter, I don't see the whole image of the, of the object, right? I see only one pixel. And so when I look back at the sun, I see, a, 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 I see an Einstein ring corresponding to the location, to my location in that image. image. And so if I move the spacecraft and I record brightness of the Einstein ring from pixel to pixel, I, I'm assembling the whole image now. So that image will be convolved, the, the, the source convolved to the point spread function of the SGL. And so it will be blurred. I will talk about this in, in a minute. But realistically, my objective would be to have a one meter or class telescope, maybe one to two meter telescope with a coronagraph positioned at the focal region of the SGL. And it will be looking back at the sun and will be observing brightness of the Einstein ring as it moves in the image plane. And so if I can assemble time series of that, uh, of that brightness data, I can, after that, I can use deconvolution techniques to remove the, uh, the, the PSF of the SGL to recover the image. That's what we'll be talking uh, today about. So 
let's uh, summarize the optical properties of the SGL. But before I do that, the idea of using the sun as a big magnifying glass belonged uh, to uh, originally was to Einstein, of course, when he uh, was about to publish his general theory of relativity, he computed the light deflection angle. And he, uh, he wrote a message to Hale in Caltech asking him whether or not uh, one can observe a deflection of light on the background of the sun. And back then technology was not there. So basically the answer was, yeah, but it's difficult. These days we know that uh, microlensing is everywhere. So we use microlensing to discover exoplanets. In 1976, uh, von Eschelmann, who then was the professor at Stanford University and the PI on radio science uh, experiment on Voyager 1 uh, mission, uh, he, uh, he thought about what can we do uh, to uh, amplify radio waves and essentially to get signals from, uh, from extraterrestrial, from, alien, from, from aliens. And so that was within the SETI project. And in 1979, he published a paper saying that solar, solar gravity can be used to amplify light. And so that was a good idea. And people, some, some people took this and basically run with that by proposing missions, but um, it was not developed at that time. So now we have full understanding what is happening with the SGL. Let's move on, let, me, let me move on. So if I have, um, uh, if I position my telescope in the focal region of the SGL and I have a coronagraph to block that uh, light. And so here you see the image of, uh, taken by Hubble of the Einstein ring enveloping, enveloping a, a star and a, a galaxy actually. And so if I take, a, if I have a coronagraph to essentially, so the Einstein ring is formed around the sun. And so uh, if, I, if I talk about this uh, exo-Earth positioned 100 light years away, so the thickness of the Einstein ring will be 1.3 kilometers. And so if I take a coronagraph to block that, uh, the, the solar light, then I can deal with the, uh, with the Einstein ring to, to, to get the brightness data. That will be my primary data to, um, to, for, for imaging. So that's the basic idea what we do with the SGL. Now let me, um, let me move on. So essentially, um, this is the summary of optical properties of the solar gravitational lens. For convenience, if I take a one micron as a wavelength, uh, as, as an absorbing wavelength, so the solar gravitational lens provides me a very large amplification factor, which is given by the ratio of uh, solar swirl child radius, which is about what three kilometers, divided by the wavelength. And so on the optical axis, the amplification factor is 10 to the 11th. If I use a one meter telescope, that amplification factor is now averaged, it's 10 to the 9th but still quite high. If I now include not only the monopole gravity, but also the, uh, I account for the fact that the sun is ablate. So I will have to deal with uh, something called uh, asteroid caustic. So the uh, light amplification at the cusp will be at the, at roughly at about 10 to the 10th. It has a very large uh, angular uh, resolution. It's 0.5 nanoarc seconds. So that means I can uh, use a one meter telescope and actually use it to uh, to, uh, to, have an, uh, to, to image an, a distant exoplanet with roughly you know, at, 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 uh, 15 by 15 kilometers resolution on its surface. Now we can talk about continental lines, weather patterns, topography, and all of the, all the interesting features on the surface of that exoplanet. And so as, as I mentioned, the whole imaging field, the, the, the whole field that is now being amplified and uh, greatly amplified by the solar gravitational lens, is focused on the extremely narrow pencil beam, which is around the optical axis. And so the whole image of that uh, exo, exo Earth is now compressed to a cylinder with a diameter of roughly 1.3 kilometers. This is my objective. I need to fly a spacecraft there, position it there, and uh, essentially move it pixel to pixel to observe imaging, to, to observe the image um, of, 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 of a distant object. On the left, you see the point spread function and uh, the PSF of the solar gravitational lens of the monopole sun. Essentially, it's proportional to the square of the Bessel zero function. It is not the same as a typical, as a classical telescope, which is the ratio of J1 of X to X. So this is not the same and it's a little bit wider. So uh, it's, it, 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 it behaves like one over, uh, one over R, uh, yeah, one over R. It's not like one over R to the third as a typical uh, PSF of the classical telescope. So therefore we'll get some blur from, uh, from other regions of the exos exoplanet. So, but this is the PSF. So recently 
uh, we were able to uh, do convolution and deconvolution techniques. So here on the left, you see the image of our Earth taken at a uh, 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 thousand pixel resolution, a uh, thousand by thousand, when we convolve it with the solar gravitational and spore and spring function. So this is what you see. This is the image field. This is the light field that will be uh, sampling. So it is a blur because of the, of the properties of the point spread function. So essentially, this blur can be easily removed by doing a Fourier, uh, of, of, uh, fast Fourier transform using the convolution techniques. And essentially, what we get is this. So for different techniques that we applied without actually filtering at the moment, so we can get images anywhere 256 by 256, all the way to 1000 uh, by 1000 pixels resolution. And so realistically, that was our first uh, in initial study where we didn't account for solar corona yet. This, this is pure gravity. So gravity, uh, the point spread function of only, when only gravity is involved, provide you with this unique capability for imaging. So, but the, of course, the, uh, the solar corona, the solar corona brightness is a major source of noise. We need to deal with that. So, but the capabilities are the, but the capabilities of the SGL provide you with this unique uh, features. You can actually talk about very high resolution of those distant uh, faint objects. So, but of course, the sun is not um, is not naked. There is a, a lot of uh, light around the sun, so the sun is bright. The solar corona is also very bright. So we need to deal with that. And so the way to deal with that is to count all the properties of the solar corona in the during the data uh, processing. And so looking at the uh, properties of the solar corona, here you see a famous chart of behavior of uh, uh, brightness of the solar corona and the sun. And so on, the, on this, uh, the, the red lines here, you see this is the position of the Einstein ring at 600 astronomical units away. Remember, if we are exactly at 550 AU, Einstein ring is touching the solar surface. We don't want to be there. You want to be separated from the sun. So the further we are, the better. So we can actually, uh, when, the, uh, when we move further from, from the sun, Einstein ring is separated from the sun further. And uh, here that, uh, on this, on this uh, in, another light, another red line here is uh, 1500 AU. So the Einstein ring is now further separated, but still we are dealing with the significant um, uh, flux from the significant brightness from the solar corona. And so we are dealing with K corona. And so the K corona is uh, the top line here. We need to be able to compensate for the K corona as well. But realistically, uh, our corona graph does what? It actually blocks the sun. There will be some leakage from the corona graph because no, nothing is perfect. And so we need to block the sun only to the level of the, so of, of the solar corona. So realistically, if we do that, this is good. And uh, so to block the uh, solar corona, we, don't, uh, we are not requiring coronagraphic capabilities similar to those that were de developed for, the, for W first. We, we are not talking about 10 to the 10th um, uh, uh, contrast ratio. We're talking about 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th contrast ratio, very different. So the technique that we, uh, the, the coronagraph that we developed at JPL is capable of doing this. So moving on. Um, I guess, uh, okay, so that's how we work. Uh, so, so this is our, uh, imagine this is our, the, the image, um, it's a, um, so uh, this is the um, a focal plane of our imaging telescope. And on that focal plane, we have a multi-pixel uh, detector and that detector sees the Einstein ring that is shown in the blue curve. So the blue circle. And the, the gray, uh, gray, uh, gray circle here is, uh, 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 is the sun. But sun, of course, is not naked. So essentially, we have uh, solar brightness, very significant solar brightness. Sun, sun is bright. When you buy a telescope, the first thing they tell you, don't look at the sun. But this is exactly what we have to do here. We have to look at the sun with our telescope. So coronagraph helps. And you see the, 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 the sun disk is there, the solar corona is also, is also there. So we develop, um, uh, we actually block the, uh, the solar disk with the coronagraph. And essentially, uh, 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 okay, so, okay, so uh, this is what we do. So our, our coronagraph is annular. It's not only disk, it's annular shape. And in that annular shape, essentially we need to uh, uh, block the area uh, corresponding to the solar disk. Now let's look at this. Uh, if I use one meter telescope, it has uh, some angular resolution. 
and the, 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 and the telescope sees everything that is in the blue circle here. The uh, blue, uh, blue line, it's an Einstein ring, and sort of the shaded area. This is the uh, my uh, uh, my res uh, angle. Uh, this is the uh, the resolution element of the telescope. So my telescope, I cannot resolve from 650 AU from 550. AU, I cannot resolve the thickness of the Einstein ring. The red, I can I can resolve only the circumference of the Einstein ring. And so is uh, my brightness data come from the circumference of the Einstein ring, not from the thickness. I cannot resolve the thickness because my telescope sees a much wider uh, annulus. And so if I develop a coronagraph that will block not only the sun, but also the light outside of that annulus, I'm in business. And so this is what we have developed. Basically, our coronagraph allows us to uh, sample only the light that is enveloped in the Einstein ring. And this is where we get most of the signal. And so, uh, okay, so uh, do I have it here? So, um, uh, okay. Uh, basically, what we have to uh, what we have developed this is the the tool that we used at JPL to develop to study coronagraph. The tool was developed uh, to study W first coronagraph, and so here you can see that uh, we can essentially do a quite uh, a good uh, rejection at uh, the level ten to the minus eight contrast ratio, and so we can uh, our our current coronagraph is enabling us to. I think that uh, essentially this technology is at hand and uh, it doesn't require a significant uh, de development. So the coronagraph that we have at JPL now, the prototype is allowing us to actually block the sun and uh, essentially block a little bit of the solar corona as well. So uh, here you see on the left, you see the sun only when you block the sun only. And so here, this is the signal of corona. Uh, of uh, the, the, the flux from corona. When we, on the right, you see the light uh, combined, the sun, corona, and the performance of the coronagraph. We still have the signal that is a little bit stronger than the signal from exoplanet. But um, that basically requires an integration time of roughly three minutes to get SNR of seven. So let me move through that. Recent development, uh, in the past, we treated the sun as a monopole. Now we're treating the sun as a fully extended body. And essentially the sun, as you know, it rotates, it has some obliqueness. Our, our technique now is allowing us to account for all the, uh, uh, all the distortions of, that, of the solar shape. You can account for J2, J4, J6, J8, zonal harmonics. And so on the left, you see those caustics in the PSF that we have to deal with. The most important one is the on the left, uh, top left. This is the asteroid caustic. Then it will be J4, J6, J8, compared to the monopole caustic, which is shown on the right. It's a little bit more complicated. And let's talk about this a little bit. So this is the asteroid caustic uh, that corresponds to uh, solar ablateness. And realistically, this is the largest caustic we have to deal with. J4, J6, and J8 are very small, uh, provide very small contributions because they're very small for the sun. So we need to account for the monopole and for the quadrupole of the sun. And so this is the, uh, the caustic that is formed in, um, in the point spread function of the solar gravitational lens. We need to sample that caustic field, the, the light uh, that comes from the point source in, in, in this shape. And so if we move our telescope, see the, uh, on the left, you see the caustic formed by the, uh, by the quadrupole of the sun. And the uh, crosshair is the position of our telescope within that caustic. As we move in uh, uh, within that caustic, you see what is happening on the right. So our imaging telescope sees uh, how the cusps, the signals are moving on the Einstein ring. So from any point on the surface of the exoplanet, uh, now, uh, this uh, uh, any point will, will be projected into four distinct points on the Einstein ring. Our formalism need to be able to uh, account for that and use it in, during the convolution. And so that's uh, one complication that we have to deal with. And so we dealt with it quite successfully. So here is the intensity on the Einstein ring that is produced by the point source. Uh, when the point source is being projected by the quadrupole of the sun. So it's a quadrupolar solar gravitational lens. And you see as the telescope moves, intensity changes and the position of those four, uh, four spikes are changing. And this is only point source. When we deal with the extended source, such as exoplanet, in this case, every point, uh, every point on the exoplanet is now producing a similar behavior. So the light now is um, 
now uh, uh, is basically uh, spread around around the image. And so with the uh, image deconvolution techniques, we are now able to recover from that phenomena and to, to actually uh, to recover the image. So moving on, this is what we can do today. So these are the images of our Earth taken uh, uh, sort of for different resolutions. On the left, you see the image of Earth taken at 128 by 128 pixels. And uh, uh, in the middle, um, it's, uh, on, the, on the top row, in the middle, you see that image is convolved with the point spread function of the uh, SGL. And on the right, you see image deconvolved. And so at 128 by 128, you can kind of already see the continents, even when looking at the middle picture, it's a blurred picture, right? So, but on the right, you can now talk about very decent uh, picture uh, resolution of the original image. And if you integrate longer, and the, uh, the longer integration implies a longer mission lifetime, right? So essentially, we can make an image of roughly uh, 600 by 600 pixels of uh, the object situated at 100 light years away, 30 parsec, within roughly uh, uh, eight to nine months. So with eight to nine months of integration time, moving spacecraft within the image, and we can actually recover image with this resolution. We're talking about single spacecraft. And so that's the imaging capabilities of the SGL where we also account for the solar corona contribution. So it's quite amazing actually. So moving on, uh, it's not that simple because when we deal with the realistic objects, especially when we account for the, uh, you know, for the movements uh, that all the objects in astronomy have to go through. So this is our own sun. It's a reflex motion of our own sun because sun is not fixed in the solar system. Uh, within, with respect to solar system barycenter, so the sun moves. So what you see here is the, uh, the solar wobble. Solar wobble, uh, which is under the gravitational pull of, uh, of Jupiter and uh, Saturn, and you see the sun moves quite a bit. So we need to account for something like that, but not only this. Uh, the temporal uh, effects that we accounted for is the orbital motion of the exoplanet around its host star, it's uh, the proper motion of that system with respect to the sun. And of course, reflex motion of our own sun with respect to you know, solar system, very centric frame. And so we have to account for all of those phenomena. And so on the left, I'll, I'll just show you what we have to deal with uh, to actually to position our spacecraft within the image, within the light field that is corresponding to the image. On the left, you see, we have, we, I, I'm not going through the model and assumptions, but we, we took quite a conservative assumption on the exoplanetary system, modeling from uh, modeling it using uh, the parameters of our solar system, just different planets, different uh, uh, semi-major axis and different periods. So on the left, you see astrometric signature. It's actually a displacement of the, um, of the host star with respect to its original position in the image plane. If we go through a 20 years uh, mission, the host star is actually moving with respect to its uh, position uh, at the beginning of the observation, moving quite a bit, it's about 300 kilometers. And so in three dimensions, uh, the movement, the, the, the blue curve is the, is the movement, is the motion of the uh, um, a primary optical axis of the host star with respect to the, uh, uh, at the beginning of the observational period. So our, uh, this is how exoplanet moves in, in the image plane. So because we're moving away uh, and our spacecraft moves, let, moves with, uh, uh, let's say 20 astronomical units per year. And so that image and uh, spiral now is uh, opening up and essentially each, each, each image plane, uh, the, uh, the uh, size of the orbit is slightly larger. We're talking about roughly uh, what is uh, uh, 100,000 uh, kilometers uh, orbit. And so one would think that these displacements are quite large. And so indeed they, they are large, but we don't really concerned with the displacement. We need to know uh, what velocities and accelerations we have to deal with, because this is, uh, this is the information that informs our mission design. And so these are the velocities and accelerations. So the image moves with roughly meters a second. So our spacecraft has to follow that image, but acceleration, it's a, uh, uh, pretty much at the level of few microns per second squared. 
So this capability is already uh, enabled by the current electric propulsion on a small spacecraft. So we don't uh, require any new technology to be developed. So with the small uh, accelerations that we have to deal with, our mission will be able to follow the image quite, quite reliably. So the spacecraft will have to be always on the move. And so uh, it's, uh, this is a challenge that was already addressed in the mission design. What is also interesting, let me see if I, okay. Okay, uh, what is also interesting, uh, navigation in the focal region is quite an interesting task as well, because we don't have a celestial body against which we can navigate our spacecraft. So it's a challenge. It's empty field out there. Once you move beyond the, uh, the heliopause, there is nothing. So basically it's very empty. So, but uh, the amplified light from the host star provides us with a very good beacon out there. So on the, on the right, uh, we start from the right, as uh, this is the amplified light uh, from the host star. And once we uh, reach 550 astronomical units, the uh, light from the host star is now greatly amplified. And so if you uh, look what's happening, on the, if we are not exactly on the optical axis of the host star, we see two bright dots, two bright spots. As you move close to the optical axis, those spots are now developed into the arcs. If you move even further, very close to the optical axis, those, uh, those arcs are now starting to touch each other. And when we exactly on the optical axis, this is Einstein reinformed. We don't need to go at the exactly optical axis. If we keep ourselves away from the optical axis, we have a very good guidance signal because the position of the two spots are uh, very sensitive to the uh, distance to the optical axis and the position on the image sensor also very, very, very important. It gives, it gives us angular position. So now we have F2 small spacecraft just around the host, uh, amplified light of the host star. I have uh, information on the distance to the optical axis and I have information where am I with respect to that optical axis. I can establish local reference frame. The same can be used to establish local reference frame of the exoplanet and because we can track exo um, amplified light from the host star, which is brighter than solar corona. We don't actually need coronagraph for that. I mean, a very, very elaborate coronagraph. So because we can track the light from the host star, uh, the host star will tell us exactly what the orbital parameters of the uh, exoplanets are, or the exoplanet is. Um, and essentially not one exoplanet, but every exoplanet in the system. And so when times come, when time comes, when the exoplanet becomes visible, first of all, it will emerge from the noise from the solar corona. And it, the, because of the phasing of the orbit, when the exoplanet will become visible, we know exactly where it will be. And essentially the position that we require, it's about 100 meters from the, uh, within the image of the exoplanet. So we have a very good way to establish local reference frames. So navigation is not a key problem. And so we remove, uh, sort of we reduce that uh, challenge and we, uh, our mission now accounts for that. So moving on, uh, let's talk about the mission very, very, uh, a little bit. I know the time run, runs fast. And so realistically uh, to get there, uh, to get there to this large uh, distances, we don't want to wait for a long time. The challenge is actually the distance, right? If the exoplanet, if the focal region would be anywhere around uh, Pluto, orbit of Pluto, we'll get there in the next, what, in the next decade. But the challenge here, how to get there where, where the so focal region of the solar gravity lens uh, opens up within, uh, in, in decade, not centuries. So we need to move fast. And the velocities that we require has to be larger than 20 AU per year. Nothing, can, nothing was done with this velocity. So basically in the, in, in the past, we have flown Voyager spacecraft, that, which is the fastest spacecraft in New Horizons. Both of them reached velocities of roughly three astronomical units per year. So we, we are talking about 20 AU. Well, how that can be done? So for that, we will be using, uh, we looked at a number of technologies. Chemical propulsion with the, even if you use uh, current, um, you know, Falcon uh, Heavy or maybe even star, uh, a Starship that is being developed, we can get um, velocities of roughly 15, uh, 15 EU per year, but that requires very close flyby around the sun with a very heavy shielding. And so a very large solid, rock, uh, solid uh, rocket motor. And so this is very challenging, but can be done. So chemical propulsion can give us about 15 EU per year. Solar thermal, uh, but again, it's a lot of issues. It's a heavy spacecraft. And so basically there are lots of things that we can contemplate, but uh, what we think is the solar sailing would be the best technique to, 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 
to, to use for this purpose. And solar sailing is the technique that uses a momentum that is carried by the uh, solar photons. And so momentum transfer occurs on the sail material on the, on the sail surface. And essentially the, um, the solar sails are now being accelerated by the solar radiation pressure to very high velocities. The challenge is essentially how to get close to the sun because the effectiveness of that mechanism improves, improves when you uh, are very close with the sun. So this is why we developed technique that a uh, new, uh, new sail, uh, sailcraft design and new, uh, a new approach how to do that uh, type of mission. So for this, we use a very different design. We are not using planar sails because planar sails are very difficult to maneuver. And so they require very difficult unfolding and deployment mechanisms. We developed a veined approach. On the left, you see a sun vein approach that was developed by the company called Lagarde in 2010. Uh, today, we are using the, 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 uh, the, the design that was developed by Explore, the, our industry partner. It's a veined approach. So with this veined approach, what, what, you, what you achieve, you now have a sailcraft behaving like a sailboat. So in a sailboat, as you know, you have, a, uh, you have wind you work against, you have a sail and you have a rudder essentially to keep your course. And you can go almost against the wind with this, uh, with the sail and the rudder. In the case of a sailcraft, we have the solar radiation pressure as the wind, we have our, our sails and we have reaction wheels playing the role of a rudder. And so we can contemplate now trajectories uh, actually tucking against the sun. And so this is the trajectory that we are using for this purpose. And essentially this is the trajectory we uh, start with high Earth orbit, getting the using right share capabilities. And so once we deploy from high Earth orbit, it takes us about five months to get uh, to the Mercury uh, orbit. So once we go in by, by the Mercury, now the, uh, our sailcraft is now being accelerated quite, quite extensively. During that flight, we verify a lot of uh, important parameters on the sailcraft. And essentially, once we go in behind the sun, autonomous operations kick in. And so we need to approach the sun of roughly by, uh, by a 20 solar radii to get to the uh, 20 astronomical units per year, 20, 25 solar radii. And so this, uh, the, the, the materials that are required, required for that, they're almost ready. So first of all, today we can achieve velocities of roughly 10 AU per year. So with the materials that now are being developed at UCLA at Caltech, we have those material samples so we can, once they will be manufactured, I think we can reliably talk about velocities of 20 AU per year. And it's not, it's not only cell materials that matter, it's also the structures on the spacecraft because thermal load is significant. So, but we can deal with those, uh, with, with those issues. So this is our mission design. I will go very briefly, just a conceptual. We go, uh, we use right share to fly uh, several uh, spacecraft. We use something called a uh, string of pearls approach where each pearl has roughly five spacecraft, small spacecraft. We're talking about a spacecraft with the uh, mass of roughly 70 kilograms, 50 to 70 kilos. And so 50 to 70 kilos will be launched uh, by right share, right share. And so this spacecraft will be diving into the sun uh, once they are assembled in high earth orbit. And then once they go through the solar perihelion, they're moving quite rapidly. And so then it just uh, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the transit time, once they reach focal region of the solar gravitational lens, they will start absorbing host, uh, the amplified light from the host star. And then uh, uh, so a few of them will go and start absorbing the image of the exoplanet. So it's again, we are using uh, solar sailing capabilities and a small spacecraft capabilities to reduce the mission cost. And essentially our estimates are showing that this mission is quite affordable. So this is the concept, I, I will not go into details, but what we develop now is the technology demonstration mission that we uh, will demonstrate within our phase three approach. So this is our vehicle that we already built, uh, the, the prototype of this vehicle so this is, uh, we uh, will achieve area to mass ratio of roughly 50, kilo, 50 meters squared per, per kilogram. This vehicle will be able to achieve velocities of six to eight astronomical units per year. And the total mass of that vehicle today, uh, we estimated roughly six kilograms. So this uh, technology demonstration mission will be able to fly a payload of roughly one kilogram payload, and it will be able to reach those uh, high velocities. So uh, from that, uh, we'll have to scale up, of course, but uh, this is very unique capabilities that is now being uh, demonstrated 
in the in the laboratory and soon we will fly it uh, in in two two years so what we have today so this is this is the trajectory how we will fly that a tdm in uh, 2023 2024 so this is the uh, design uh, that is assembly of that vehicle so we, we built a prototype i will just show a few charts here so the veins have been assembled and tested and essentially this is the vehicle now being built uh it's very recent development it's only a few weeks old so this vehicle is being assembled in uh in the facility of uh, lagarde company lagarde in tustin california and so this is the vehicle it's it's one third a uh, scaled prototype and uh, so this vehicle uh we will will be flown is a partnership public-private partnership between NASA and the private industry. So we will fly this mission in about two years from today. This mission will carry scientific payloads. And we think about a success, a, a, a sort of a series of uh, flights from, for, for those TDMs with ever increasing capabilities. So essentially, we will uh, fly those vehicles uh, in cis lunar space. We'll fly those vehicles in, um, in uh, going to the sun. And thinking about cis lunar space, Think about using solar sails as Amazon delivery truck. Because of the in interest in the cis lunar activities, we can go between high Earth orbit and lunar orbit pretty much without any, uh, any propellant. We use, uh, again, solar sailing. And uh, on, on, the, on the sails, we embed there is a thin film uh, that is uh, photovoltaics and also thin film radio antennas. So we can use uh, solar sails uh, multipurpose uh, for uh, for the, not only the solar propulsion, but also communication and uh, power source. So we can go between Earth, high Earth orbit and the, and the lunar orbit quite, you know, infinite amount of times. Go there, come in back, deliver something and inspect. But this is the technique that can be used not only in this lunar space, because we're talking about eight to five to, uh, what, eight to 10 AU per year. Now we can talk about chasing those interstellar objects that are visiting the solar system. We can go quite fast with those and sort of increasing the sail area so can allow us to go even faster. So that, uh, that means that access to the deep regions of the solar system will be enabled by those missions that are going fast with sensors that are light and uh, uh, with high performance sensors. We can talk about going to Pluto, not in 16 years as New Horizons did. We're talking about four years getting to Pluto. And so that's something quite, quite unique. This is capabilities being developed. In terms of the thermal behavior, of course, you will ask me, okay, you're going by the sun, it will be very hot. Yes, indeed, it, it, it is very hot. Our thermal analysis that was done on the prototype pretty much closes uh, every orbit except probably uh, the uh, region around the sun, uh, uh, 0.25 AU per year. So the thermal behavior, star trackers and the wheels, um, it will require a little you know, um, uh, coating on top of those, of those materials. And so we should be able to address those, you know, uh, uh, thermal violations soon. So it's not a problem, it's just it's a development and this will be done by the PDR that will be going through in a year from today. So the PDR will uh, go through uh, in, in September 2022 to sort of to, uh, to open up that mission for real flights. So this is the mission development. Uh, just to summarize, we have a very unique uh, capability to image exoplanets. So let me move on here. So uh, the, we have a very strong foundation. So we have uh, now proven that solar gravitational lens allows for direct imaging of exoplanets. It's challenging, but it's, it's doable. We can talk about uh, a spatially, a spatially resolved uh, uh, a spectral polarimetry. So essentially this is something uh, very unique. We can uniquely identify the presence of, uh, you know, um, if this planet is habitable or inhabited. It's, it's, it's a very unique capability that is being developed. So we have a very good mission. The mission is, uh, is evolving and with the technique that we have uh, developed for the, solar, for, for the solar sailing will allow us to reach velocities that we need for this mission. Of course, there are a lot of technology development that is uh, still needed, but this technology is within the reach. I'm not talking about technology roadmap here, but if you're interested, I will be very happy to discuss that because we have a very uh, significant collaboration here at JPL in Southern California. And we would like to extend an invitation for you to join us to do this. And so the plan is very ambitious. Uh, realistically, we plan for the next couple of years to formulate all the technologies that are needed for this mission, to, de to develop the cost estimates for the mission, to develop mission design and start flying our TDMs. We hope to initiate the proper mission to the, to the focal region of the SGL 
sometime around 2030. Of course, it takes time. We are not saying that it's, uh, it will be, we can do this immediately today, but in the next decade, we'll focus significantly, significant efforts on developing the technologies that are needed to take us there. And of course, uh, it will take 20 years to get to the solar gravitational lens. Unfortunately, yes, this is the case. And so by the time I'm 100, I would like to see the image of the so of the exo exoplanet, and so one thing is, uh, you know, uh, when uh, when I'm presenting this, uh, people ask, "Well, it takes so long." Of course, the answer is either fly faster or live longer, right? And so we have to work on both of these technologies for longer life and for moving fast. So, but realistically, I think this is quite a unique opportunity that uh, we would like you to collaborate with us. And so maybe uh, the questions that we have not yet addressed fully, uh, how do we do spectroscopy? How do we do essentially in terms of observations? We do imaging quite well. We have a significant signal there, but now it's a question, what can we really look for? We have three mission objectives. It's actually resolved imaging of the surfaces of exoplanets, then uh, looking at the, temporal, at the temporally varying behavior on the surface of exoplanet, and then looking for signs of life, looking for some, some, ga some gas, uh, sort, sort, sort of the uh, signatures within uh, uh, the wavelength of operations. Uh, operation. It's uh, from uh, optical and the near infrared domain. So this is what we are thinking about. And so whatever gas we can talk about, methane, oxygen, nitrogen. So how can we use the data that we can see to tell something about the current conditions on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the objects. And so this is quite a unique phase in our mission investigation. And we would like you to collaborate with us. And so we would like to expand this, uh, this work to invite, uh, invite you to, 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 do, to do this further. So on this note, at some point, hopefully soon, we'll see something like this. This is the true colors of our Earth. As you know, our eyes essentially is uh, averaging the light. And so the true colors are here. It's machine colors, right? So the true colors are slightly more greener, but that, that this is our, uh, our earth in the true colors. And so at some point we would like, I would like us to be able to see images of uh, faint objects such as exoplanet or maybe quasars. We can resolve quasars uh, to very high, uh, high accuracy as well. Our, I, I didn't talk about this, but we can have an image of a quasar of roughly 300 kilometers. The quasars are situated of, 12 billion years away. So that's another topic for conversation, but here exoplanets, and we hope to see something like this very soon. Thank you for, very much for your, for your attention. Sorry, it took a little bit longer than I was planning for. Any questions, please? So uh, thank you very much, Slava. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of things to think about, um, really exciting idea. And I see there's already a couple of questions. I'm just gonna get to those in the chat before I, I get to anybody else. If you want to ask a question, you can use the raise hand function or put it in the chat. And also um, I will share Slava's email address in the chat in case you wanna contact him afterwards if you don't get a chance to. So Mike, Michael, uh, wait, you have a couple of questions on here. I'm just gonna go through a couple of these. So the first thing that Mike asks is what are your estimated exposure times for, for example, I'm guessing this 30, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we are talking about this image uh, of this object 30, uh, uh, parsec away. And so that object, uh, uh, the exposure per pixel, it's about three minutes. Within three minutes, we get signal to noise ratio of roughly 10. And so with this, uh, we need to move from pixel to pixel. And so our estimates now provide us with about seven to eight months uh, total uh, uh, inf collection of all information. This is with single spacecraft. And of course, we are planning to fly a constellation there that will reduce significantly on the total integration time. I have to tell you, I have to sort of tell you that at this moment, all temporal signatures are accounted for except for diurnal rotation. So that is the key that we will be looking at the next couple months because the planet rotates. And so rotation and the, the, there is a cloud cover. So we feel that we will be able to remove cloud cover, but what will be the impact on the total integration time is yet to be uh, studied. And so maybe we'll be able to do spectroscopy. And then as, uh, as we integrate longer, uh, maybe not in uh, seven months, but maybe in a year and a half, we should be able to remove clouds and to, to peel under the clouds and see the surface. 
So the, we, we use a technique called uh, direct deconvolution, but there is also rotational deconvolution. We did the rotational deconvolution using data from Discover spacecraft. And so rotational deconvolution allows you to uh, remove, uh, to, 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 to trace the patterns evolving on the surface of, X, of, of the object. And the rota with rotational deconvolution, you are sensitive to mid latitudes of the object. With this, we will be able to, uh, to, to to go to, to actually have the super resolution and that, that actually reduces uh, integration time quite significantly. So that, there, there are several techniques we will have to play with. And so um, maybe with your help, we can uh, go there further, uh, faster uh, studying this. But realistically, uh, my answer is uh, uh, with, even with the urinal uh, rotation, I think it's uh, uh, to get one image within pretty much um, 18 months uh, this uh, time, we will be able to get image even with the lunar rotation. And so with a single spacecraft, again, increasing on the number of spacecraft, this uh, integration time cuts significantly. Gotcha. All right. So, um, Michael, I know you have a couple other questions there. I'm going to try to make sure we get multiple people with at least one question. So I'm going to move to uh, Shabnam's one of your questions. Uh, Shabnam asks, how would, you, how would the solar cells break once they reach the focal plane? Because you'll be traveling pretty fast. Uh, once we go from, um, okay, uh, the solar cells are really needed once we go very close to the sun. So because this is where we get the, uh, the most, uh, uh, most acceleration, most solar radiation pressure. Once we reach the orbit of uh, maybe one AU, maybe orbit of Mars, we just drop them. We don't need them because essentially it's empty space. We don't gain anything from them, except probably if we will use a part of the sail, uh, re re repurpose it for, for communication capability. But uh, so far we're planning on the optical communication. We will use the same telescope, a meter class telescope to communicate. But uh, solar sails are uh, currently, we think we will just drop in them um, uh, because think, there is no need. So I think the broader question though, is if you're traveling at a pretty high velocity and then you need to basically stop at a particular location. We I don't need to stop because we're talking about um, it's a foc It's not a focal point, it's a focal line. As we move along that focal line, we still sample the same object. That's the advantage, we don't need to stop. Okay, um, Rich, I think you had your hand up. I'll let you unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I have, I'm a micro lenser and an interferometrist and I've long since uh, stopped looking to image anything. I've just, <laughs> It, it seems like it's a very high bar to, to build up an image of an exoplanet, whereas I, I'm not sure if I understand the, the scientific utility of an image. I would, I would think it would be sufficient to sample, you know, using a very narrow beam, uh, do some sampling and spectroscopy on the face of a planet, and then you can discriminate from cloudy areas and non-cloudy and water areas and land masses and that would probably be sufficient so in in actually building up your uh, science requirements matrix um i i i guess i just don't see the the scientific utility in in, in building up an image by a fourier inversion it seems like an awful lot of work to do that i I love the question and I fully agree with you. And the reason is that we needed to study the technique before it would become presentable to the science community. We now understand the technique quite well. And so now the questions we need to pose is, what do we do with this technique? Realistically, your question is very valid. So, but to move it through the community acceptance in a sense, we need to demonstrate the technique, the full potential of the technique, right? And so we've done that. Now we can actually uh, look at something that you mentioned, looking at the you know spot, spot check on the image on, on the surface. And that may be what we really want. So the science traceability is now being developed. So we took a very ambitious goal on ourselves and we have proven that it works, but now let's take reality. And so maybe we don't need to do that. But then after all, it's the, 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 the other side in me tells, if I go that far, why don't, why don't I do everything? And so realistically, 
the truth is in between. And I totally agree with you. Maybe we'll need to chat uh, you know, separately, but we need some help as to structuring uh, true science questions that this technique can be used for to answer. And so uh, now we are at the point where we can estimate a signal to noise ratio for different scenarios. Let's talk about different scenarios. We understand we need to understand what is the most optimal what is the most optimal use of this technique for other I mean, for, the, for for any science that you would like to do. So thank you for your question. Totally, I agree with you. Yeah, and just and just one of those things you see in a lot of planetary emissions. You always have to have a pretty picture to appeal to actually get something. exactly. Look, we so, need, uh, yeah, we need a pretty picture, but uh, you know. That pretty picture helped us to move, right? If there will be not that pretty picture, there will be, honestly, there will be no funding, right? So we need to develop something that actually will catch the people's imagination. It's a nice dinner conversation after all. And you, you, you see the excitement of people who are amateurs because for them, they all used to have to cell phones, right? And so people explore life around themselves using cell phones, taking pictures. That's a nice way to communicate, but Look, between us, we need to identify a true science uh, application for this. So uh, that's a good move on to our Star Trek imaging an exoplanet using fancy new technology. Robbie, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, so just to follow up on what Rich said and what Mike was asking. Um, yeah, you know, just getting a picture is probably is good PR and all, but I think uh, I assumed in your talk uh, when you were talking that the, the, there will be an instrument board on, on board uh, uh, that could do spectroscopy and that could do some sort of a, you know, a high resolution uh, data analysis that you could, we could do it uh, just like what we do with, uh, you know, Lu, uh, some uh, Lua or Habex uh, instrument board that we have. One thing is though that uh, you don't, it, having clouds is not a bug, it's a feature of a planet. So if you you don't need to subtract it or anything, I mean it's it, it implies there is some water on the planet, and, exactly. right? So so it, it's it's fine, and then the spectroscopy can probably depending upon what uh, wavelengths that you are looking at, you know you can get some uh, surface um, feature information uh, on, in the spectroscopic data. The other thing I was going to say is that you know, with this method you would be able to look only at one target, right? And uh, can you do multiple targets? Ravi, um, uh, first of all, Prabal, thank you for inviting me to this group because your questions are making my life easier. So I don't need to go for the, for the full, you know, uh, for, for the full uh, ambitious objectives. But yet, you know, um, I agree. So basically spectroscopy can be done with the same instrument because we disperse light in different, uh, we read the uh, brightness in different wavelengths. And we can actually use the same instrument to do spectroscopy. And so, indeed, spectroscopy will be, in my mind, the most important, the, the most important ob observable there. And speaking about multi-planetary, uh, sort of about the multiple targets, yes, this technique is like a planetary science. When we do, uh, when we study uh, Jupiter or Saturn, when we fly a spacecraft around Jupiter, we study the entire set of satellites orbiting Jupiter or Saturn, right? So it's like in the sense of planetary science, we will study entire planetary system orbiting that host star. A trappist will study all the planets. Any, any multiple targets within uh, orbiting that uh, host star will be doing this. And the reason basically, um, because we are limited by propulsion with solar sailing, at this, with this mission design, we cannot repoint and go elsewhere because it will require significant lateral motion. In the future, when the technologies that are being discussed, like fusion, maybe some nuclear technologies, when those technologies will be developed, yes, we can do that. But for now, we focus on a single planetary system. That's how I see it. All right, Rich, I'm gonna let you ask the last question then I do it kind of have to close this up. I actually have a meeting I'm already late for, but I posted Slava's um, email address in the chat. Uh, you can also just find, you can ask me if you wanna ask more questions. Um, and Slava, after this, thank you so much for this talk. Go ahead, Rich. Rich sorry. Yes, Slava, thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Yeah, it seems to me like when you're constructing your science argument for this, that the, the thing you need to confront or that the technique needs to confront is that all right with with um, transit spectroscopy I can get the I can get biomarkers anything that's out of equilibrium in an atmosphere 
And so this technique, the, the science argument would need to argue for why that isn't enough. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can see some arguments, but th those have to be developed. And it I always has to be like juxtaposed against our ability to do transit spectroscopy and why, you know, why isn't just knowing that there's life there enough? So can I follow up on that uh, yes. with quickly, very quickly? Okay. So the transit spectroscopy, uh, as Preble and I mean, everybody, everybody knows, it's the clouds are a problem for um, when you are when you are trying to do that with direct imaging. I mean, you you do have you you see the surf, uh, you see the whole planet, and it's it's not a problem. Like I said, it's it's a uh, it's it, it's what the planet has. And it won't limit depending upon where you're looking at, in which wavelengths you're looking at, for example, in infrared or in the near near infrared. Uh, you might be able to see through the clouds and see the surface features in the direct imaging. For transit spectroscopy, of course, you're limited to the yes. only the upper I'm part of the I'm sorry. Right. And I, I and uh, and definitely I agree that uh, the science case must be uh, uh, better developed in a sense because. Uh, the techniques the transit spectroscopy allows you to detect uh, a presence of uh, uh, you know important gases and of course transit spectroscopy works only when the planet is edge on when the target is edge on for right. uh, other uh, for other orbits uh transit spectroscopy will not work right because there will be no transits and so this technique go allows you anyway to go further and essentially look at the surface features and you can see if there is ice caps there is you know all the all the things that will allow you to study uh, the presence of that, uh, so, so, so sort of the surface of that exoplanet to a better precision. At some point, we'll have many spectra from exoplanets, and the next step will be, what do we do next? And I think this is where this technique may be helpful in a sense. But for, uh, so uh, the development of the science case is important. And I, I, I ask you for, to, for your advice as to what is the best way to pitch this technique to actually, you know, to, to, to give it a life in a sense, because yes, it is possible. And then I, I also recognize that going out there and building a mission like that requires significant uh, resources, right? And so we're talking about a mission actually uh, uh, quite affordable, but still, um, what do we gain with this technique, right? Which we cannot gain otherwise. And what do we improve? Imaging is good. But the, a part of that information will be given to us before we go there. So the, to, for target selection purposes, we'll have all those techniques already used on the, on the object. What do we gain by going to the solar gravitational lens? So please help, please help us here. And essentially that is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, is, it is only now that we are able to now to discuss those questions because we can do quantitative estimates for the signal-to-noise ratio and study realistically the observable scenarios. So the technique is still novel. So please help if you have any ideas will be very, very nice. I'm not saying we know everything. I don't, I don't want to sound like we know this is it. No, 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 we are studying the mission. Let's join forces and do this together. Thank you very much. Awesome, and then on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and ask any other questions, please send the slide directly. Um, and I'm sure we can have really fruitful conversations after that. But thank you again, Slava. Uh, thank you for great questions too. I know we didn't get to all of them, um, but really, really interesting talk. Excellent, thank you very much. And I'm sure I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.